I'm a UMass alum, as you know. I came here um, really just because it was an affordable school for me and my family. I'm number six of seven, and I just loved my experience here. I'll tell you my favorite UMass story, and then I'd like to hear about how this relates to what's happening at UMass today. I was in a history class, and we were studying the American Vietnam War. And the man next to me was a veteran in a wheelchair. A man on my left was a Vietnamese immigrant. And there was a father in the front of the class who had lost his son in the war. And I'm sitting in this classroom saying, my friends across the river are not experiencing this. Like only UMass can deliver an educational experience like this. And I want to know, you know, there's so much special about this university, but if you could start off telling us about how important diversity is and immigrants to this school. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and welcome. Welcome to Boston's only an anchor public research university. Let me start where I usually end, and then conceptually we'll work our way towards that. If we did not have UMass Boston, we would have to invent it. This is how essential this university is to the project of democratic citizenship in the iconic city of higher education. So UMass Boston has such a unique place in the entire ecology of higher education in the city of Boston. And there are many, many reasons why. I think Paul, as often is the case, you went to the heart of the matter. It's the extraordinary diversity in the, in, in the most meaningful, not in the vulgarized way in which often diversity is spoken, in the most meaningful way where our students, our faculty, our staff embody the journeys, the experiences of the folk of this extraordinary city. Immigrants, refugees, vets, like me, first generation to college, transfer students, likewise. So when we talk about higher education today in the 21st century, we are seeing an age of fragility where all institutions of society are facing extraordinary, unprecedented challenges. What are the issues at UMass Boston that make, make us different and that enable us to deliver an education that is truly for the city, for the times, is an extraordinary story of our origins, of the here and now, and maybe most importantly, let's call it You Must Boston 2.0, our future. You know, the great Soren Kierkegaard once said, we, we only understand ourselves looking backwards. That's true of institutions. The origins of UMass Boston flowed from a very noble idea. The idea that in the context of the invasion of racialized inequality into every domain of economy and society, we needed a different institution. We needed an institution for our communities. Uh, we deliver a world-class education at a wonderful, wonderful price point with all kinds of uh, opportunities to connect with our communities so that the project of research, of development, of community work flows from authentic, organic relationships with all our communities that are represented in this hall uh, today and really every day. And that is different. I have white hair. I, I've been around the block. I've been at many, many universities. UMass Boston has a unique endowment that flows from 
its locational place. I mean, this is the most gorgeous campus, not only the city of Boston, in the United States. A harbor campus with an extraordinary level of diversity, a, a diversity that announces the future of where our country is going. I've said last night, Paul we and I were chatting, no high income country in the history of the world has done well what you must Boston, the city of Boston, uh, need, need to do today. Connecting with and easing the transition to the family of the Commonwealth, to the practice of democratic citizenship, to the economies of the 21st century, when the only sector of the population growing now are kids growing up in immigrant origin families of color. 80% of the growth in the city of Boston moving forward will come from that demographic. That is the future of our country. I was in LA for 10 years. Let me give you the LA take on that. Boston, our demography is coming to a neighborhood near you, right? That's like in the movies. So to, to summarize, an extraordinary faculty, a wonderful endowment from being in this beautiful harbor city, in the city of Boston, and a clear sense of the mission of public education in the age of fragility. This is where we are today. I'd like to ask about how you see the role of public education with some of the distrust that's happening now across universities. There are polls out recently that people don't trust their leaders as much anymore. And also, just your comments on what we need to do to become a civil society and things around public policy and how, do we, how does UMass, what's the role of UMass in educating people to help lead a civil society where they will trust their institutions? Terrific question. Let me start with the former, and then we'll migrate to the latter. I think that there is a crisis uh, of trust in all of the institutions of society, universities included. But make no mistake, we have a fundamental crisis when uh, science, truth, um, the, the fundamental architecture of what is required for the practice of democracy to thrive are all under, uh, under siege. So the crisis of the university, the crisis of trust in the university flows from that general crisis that now affects nearly all institutions of society, Paul. I think that there are other issues that we need to own. Uh, there is an arms race in higher education. The costs are outrageous. I taught for a decade at a, at a university. I'm not going to talk about the university across the river where I taught for many years. I'm going to talk about another university. I was a senior professor at NYU for about a decade. Tuition at NYU today is over $70,000 at Columbia, across the campus, across the city, it's probably about $100,000. So the price point, uh, the crisis of trust, um, a strong labor market that is offering interesting avenues and pathways to connect with, with, the, with the jobs of the future today, uh, are all undermining faith and trust in higher education. I think we have a very competitive price point. I think we have a narrative about the purpose of higher education in the 21st century that is uh, extraordinary, clear, focus, and on point. On the second issue, on the issue of how do we get to a better place in terms of the invasion of incivility into 
everything. I mean, it's the first thing we hit is the nuclear option when facing nearly any uh, uh, contentious uh, debate. First, first, we need to slow down. First, we need to listen. First, we need the empathic gymnastics that puts us in the shoes of others. We need a new literacy, a socio-emotional literacy that enables us to better enter, to come not to just tolerate, but to admire the phenomenologies, the perspectives, the lived experiences of folk that come from traditions different than our own. I think slowing down, I think questioning the taken for granted practices that inform our scholarly, our citizenship, our, our, our general orientation towards the other is a fundamental point of departure. We need to learn to listen. We need to learn to empathize. We need to learn a new socio-emotional GPS to manage a world that is going to throw tremendous challenges to us now and moving forward. All right, great. A few months ago, um, you and I made a big announcement that we're working together now on a new initiative, the Institute for Applied AI. And the goal of the school, as we described it a few months ago, was really to use AI to teach students here two things across all six schools. One, how do they use AI to be a better student, like with personalized learning? And the second is how they can use AI to be better at their careers. I'd love to hear your thoughts about, now it's a few months later, there's a lot going on happening with AI here on campus, and I'd like to hear your thoughts and kind of hopes for how this will transform UMass going forward. Well, first, Paul, thank you. Thank you for your vision. Uh, thank you for your generosity and your trust in making this transformational gift to our school so our students can get in front of uh, what is a new development that, like the second law of thermodynamics, like the law of gravity, is not going away. Artificial intelligence is here and will be here with us now and moving forward. Now, if we look back 10,000 years of human innovation, even, even, even before, uh, when the folk in what we now call Mesopotamia sat down and for the first time sat down and used a technology ready, uh, readily available to create a new technology. And that was the stylus and the clay to begin reading and writing. That moment changed everything in the human condition, including our brains. Reading and writing are epigenetic phenomena, and they've changed our anatomy. The structure of the human brain is different because of literacy. I think that the impact of AI will be of a similar magnitude. It will change everything now and moving forward. At every turn, we take the beginning of writing. Let's take 10,000 years ago, the origins of agriculture. Fast forward to whatever, two, 200 years ago, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. At every technological turn, we have seen progress, and we have seen casualties. We have seen new inequalities flowing 
from every technological innovation. So I think your gift does three things. First, how do we make sure that our students have all the tools they're going to need, if they so choose, to be at the forefront of this, the most significant civilization, civilizational, I'm, a, I'm still an English language learner, so I have problems with some words, civilizational uh, transformation um, of the times. Having the students have the tools to become better students. I think it was a great Paul English who said, in 10 years, you're either going to be in AI or you're going to be working for somebody who is in AI. So that's, that's numero uno. That's a very, very significant piece here. The second piece really is how do we get in front of the kinds of dilemmas that AI will present? Uh, we were having a wonderful uh, meeting with uh, our Attorney General, Andrea Campbell. Dorchester, individual, historic force in our commonwealth, in our country. I believe she's the president of the American Association of Attorneys General. And casually she said, look, this is, AI has totally transformed the administration of justice. And most attorneys general in our country are just, they're not equipped to understand and to fully engage with what this means to their domain. And there is nothing, nothing as important as the administration of justice. So we need to understand, A, what are the tools all our students need to have? B, how do we get in front of these new dilemmas that will come our way? Fundamentally, we're going to need to get in front of the ethic and the implications of artificial intelligence ethically. And we need to get in front of the inequalities that in the last 10,000 years we've seen with every technological innovation. So it's a big topic, it's an existential topic, and it's a topic that we are so proud that with your extraordinary vision, Paul, we're addressing at UMass uh, Boston. And we have amazing, wonderful, wonderful news that we're going to be releasing in this area shortly. That's great. I'm excited to continue to partner on that. We just have a couple minutes left, and I think the audience might like to hear, as the leader of this very important public university, what's the role of UMass in creating nonprofits? Or what advice do you have for all the nonprofit leaders in this audience and watching this talk about what they should do to be an effective nonprofit leader in the 21st century. Just what do you think of some of the important elements there? I think that uh, given the perfect storms, democracies, not just ours, but around the world are facing a very muscular, a very robust civil society with NGOs, with, with, with civil and civic groups taking the lead to address the day in and day out very basic challenges of society is fundamental for our ability to continue to protect the project of a culturally plural democracy. There is nothing for ordain about democracy. Democracy needs to be tended, needs to be nurtured, and I think the NGOs are the vertebra of a society that is moving towards correcting the tremendous inequalities we're facing today. I was so proud. Yesterday, Paul, we were gathered with a number of our UMass Boston students. Madam President, it's wonderful to see you. Uh, and one of our alums in her NGO, uh, on uh, foster children, uh, on homeless children, on, on the homeless uh, population, such extraordinarily important work for the work of democracy. Thank you. And as we say, you must Boston. Su casa es mi casa. 
Mi casa es su casa. Welcome. Okay. <laughs>